get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Svi Band. He's the co-founder of Contactually. Contactually is a relationship marketing platform and ensures that you stay top of mind with the relationships that matter to help you grow your business. As Svi, you and I know relationships is you know the most important thing. Svi helped bring Contactually from idea in his Evernote to 52 employees and counting, millions in revenue, and 12 million in venture backing and thousands of paying customers. Svi is active in fostering the tech community in DC and has been named a tech titan three times. Svi, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. So what is a tech titan? Uh, it is a award given out by one of the bigger publications here in DC for someone who is, uh, I guess you could say, like you know, a leader or kind of mm-hmm. you know, a big mainstay in the local startup community, or yeah. not local startup community, lo- local technology community in general. So we have a lot to cover with Contactually and your journey. I always like to start off with a fun fact that is weird or interesting, and you never wear the color green. <laughs> yes, uh, I probably should have given you a, a slightly less embarrassing fun fact, but yeah, my, uh, do you want me to tell you the story? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so it, it started kind of, you know, on, I think, you know, my great, great grandparents' side, um, they, you know, there's, I think someone at some point developed a superstition hmm. or realized the superstition that whenever anyone in the family wears anything green, um, someone close to the family dies. Really? And there was enough, I hate to say, even like in more recent years, there's been enough proof. Anecdotal that, evidence, we'll call an, it. Yeah, anecdotal evidence that makes it like enough of like a taboo in my family. So like I don't own anything green. Um, my wife's an Eagles fan, so she <laughs> can't wear she can't wear any green jerseys. That's impossible. At least not around my family. I know yeah. it, it was. There's like a, you can get like a couple like pink ones or black ones, things like that. Um, but yeah, no, I uh, I I will refuse to wear anything green. That is um, crazy. Not necessarily because I believe it, but it's like, all right, why? Why test, test it, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> why test it? Um, so we'll go into the journey of Contactually, but um, what's been the hardest part of the journey so far? You've had a lot um, of success, obviously. Yeah, I mean, we're very fortunate that I think when you take a take a big step back, you know, you kind of look at the graphs and charts and reports and say, like, all right, wow, Contactually really has yeah. turned into something. Yeah. Um, and I am thankful for that. Um, I think that the hardest challenge for me has been, um, honestly, ma- managing my own emotions. Hmm. Right. I mean, I think you know probably you know, many other entrepreneurs that you've had on your podcast have talked about the incredible highs and incredible lows, yeah. and that is something that I still actively fight on a day to day basis. Yeah. What's an example of one of those to give people an idea? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it started uh, like I can go even today. Um, you know. Everything's you know, everything's looking great. November was a good solid month for uh, for growth. Um, you know, came in really happy and excited, and everything's great. And then one of our then you know one of our customer success reps came and said, "Hey, one of our larger customers is having an issue." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" All of a sudden, I'm like fearing failure. Right. Like right. Like oh my god! Like they're gonna leave. All of our other customers are gonna leave. That's over. You go to the and, extreme. Yeah, and then I had a, a meeting with our product team where we're going over a new product and kind of what's coming on the pipeline. I'm like, oh my god, this is awesome! They know what we're doing. They don't even need me around anymore. They just kind of like know exactly what's going on. And then you have a uh, and then you have a meeting with kind of you know, with one of your employees who's leaving, and you're like, wow, like this is really going to be really tough when they leave, yeah. right? And so you kind of experience those highs and lows, and especially yeah. because like as founder and CEO. You know, I'm ultimately responsible and it affects me more than yeah. anything else. 
it's been incredibly challenging. Yeah. So. so how do you manage those internal thoughts? Because I was reading your blog, po- uh, your blog post on doubt. And so I definitely wanted to talk about this. And, you know, I had written down, how does it creep in? And then how do you combat it? How do you combat those things when it does creep in? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing, um, and so I, th- there are a number of different tactics. I th- think the most important thing when you're dealing with anything psychological is at least to gain awareness. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so I, I make sure that I'm at least aware of like, this is just simply how I'm feeling. Hmm. It's not how the world actually is. Yeah. This is how I'm, this is how I am perceiving the world right now. And I have to be very mindful of that. Right. Even Mm -hmm. at the extreme highs, I still have to be mindful. Like, listen, it's not like, yeah, we're going to be billionaires tomorrow. Right. This is just simply the state that I'm in. And I think that allows me to decouple and that allows you to then attack it. Hmm. Right. So I know, all right, well, to change my mood, um, I exercise every day. Yeah. Um, you know, I, if I'm feeling really, really low, I will take a step back and kind of, you know, just go do something else for a few minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think for me, at least gaining the awareness that it's not reality, it's simply my perception mm-hmm. of reality. Yeah. That was that that was an incredibly important trick. And that's the one kind of takeaway I recommend everyone walked away. Because yeah. then after that, then you can kind of, you know, implement things like, you know, displaying gratitude, um, working out more, eating right, right, et cetera. But I think you just have to treat your own emotions as something that you can control. Yeah. Speed, thanks for sharing that. That's really good. And it makes me think about, I need to study panic, people with panic disorders more because that's exactly, I think what they teach. They feel like they're dying. And the fact that they just know, oh, this is just my perception of reality. So I'm going to have to look into studying that. Um, So I want to go back to, Growing up, where'd you grow up? What was a big influence for you? Oh man, I uh, I have a long story. I was born in my my mother's an artist, and my father was an academic. So I grew up. I was born in Boston, grew up in San Diego, Berkeley, Santa Fe, mm. New Mexico, and then kind of for the past fifteen years or so, the D.C. area. Was he a professor um, or? Yeah. So uh, my father was an astrophysicist. Wow. And uh, then my mother was an artist. And so I do actually contribute um, both of them to, you know, one, I think having a good combination of left brain, right brain. That is creative. like the extreme, right? I know. The, the, crea- the creative thinking of an artist um, and at the same time the, you know, the technical and analytical focus and logic of, hmm. you know, a scientist. Wow. And at the same time, you know, both of them, you know, both through their actions and right. then through them guiding me. Um, taught me that, you know, pursue your dreams no matter what, right? Yeah. And that sounds very cliche, but they really lived that, right? You know, yeah. They could have chosen much more lucrative careers, much more stable careers, but instead they followed like what they truly felt was their calling. So what were dinner conversations like with astrophysicists and artists? You know, I have to really credit, uh, I have to really credit my parents. They were incredibly good at cross-pollination. <laughs> um, my mother really understood astrophysics really right and could my and could and my father could talk about like what he's working on she would get it hmm. and then my mother would talk about what she was working on and you know what she was researching or and like and my father would really understand it it was as surprising that dinner table conversations would be about like the weather because both of them did something different, <laughs> but both of them there were, were so, so engaged with their work yeah. that it actually kind of like shone through and they really kind of brought that passion home. Yeah. So how did growing up as a son of an astrophysicist help or maybe hinder you? You think I have absolutely no interest no, in it... physics. Um, you know, surprisingly, like, I actually, what I'm actually not, you know, not a heavy quantitative mind. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like math was never my strong suit. Really, I'm surprised um, actually, because you yeah, have a computer science background. Yeah, exactly. But like, you know, well, I, computer science is like was more like almost vocational, right? When the the theory and the algorithms work, that's actually something I struggled with. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, but it, it did teach me, like, it did teach me more about, like, I think you know like more about like really solid analysis of a problem. Mm-hmm. So. so in high school, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I, a software developer. Always. Oh yeah. I mean, ever since I think I was 10 years old and I picked up my first book about learning HTML and my father brought home the first computer. Um, that was kind of it for me. I hmm. mean, that there was really nothing else. What was it about it that made you want to do it? 
I think I got it, right? I mean, I got, I was always fascinated about how computers work and how you can control them and what happened, you know, so I was definitely the one who, you know, my parents' basement still is covered with like, you know, I think like just the like, and it honestly it really piqued my, um, you know, intuitive interest in really understanding how these things work. And once you yeah. understood how it worked, then you could control it too. So why CEO and not CTO? Um, that's a great question. I mean, so I, I founded the company with myself and one other software developer, yeah. um, Jeff Carbonell, who yeah. is our CTO. Yeah. Um, I've always stayed technical, but because you know, you've been uh, CTO of past companies, I have you been found CTO, it. Yeah. But I think one of the one of the strong, and it, this could be related to my um, to my parents, but one of the strong skills I believe I've been able to build up over the years is I can be a developer that can talk to human beings, <laughs> right? Um, right? And not to say you know that my fellow software developers are terrible at communication, but oftentimes mm -hmm. you know there is this like natural introversion. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I have no problem; I can speak to a customer who's totally non-tech savvy mm -hmm. and understand their pains, understand what they need. Um, and translate that to technology. So mm. I do think that like I've had a fair amount of business acumen built up over the years. Mm -hmm. And given that Contactually was my idea at inception, um, it was naturally obvious that I'd be the one to uh, to be CEO. Got it, got it. So leading up to Contactually, CV, what was another influential company or experience, job experience that was big for you and shaping shaping you? Oh, absolutely. So it's uh, so before Contactually, I spent about three or four years as a freelance software developer, mm -hmm. and I think that honed my skills at a number of things. Obviously, one is you know building really strong software for amazing, amazing clients mm -hmm. and brands. I think the uh, but honestly, the catalyzing thing for it, and this is honestly why Contactually ex exists today. Yeah is my need to really force myself out of my shell and become solid at business development and you know be and really gain that business mind mm -hmm. um, because those freelance software developer right you know you you keep what you kill and right. that was that yeah. was really important for me right yeah. and i i ended up becoming and becoming a, a great business development person and not like almost naturally and i think that that experience is actually what guided us to start Contactually. Yeah. So, yeah, because I saw you're founder of uh, Struck, that Struck TO, yeah. and then Skivas Arts, where, you know, your, your firm, uh, the design firm and development firm. So when was the moment you decided, okay, I need to, I need to do this Contactually thing? Yeah, there was no one moment. No. That's the thing. Yeah, and I think that the reality is like some people like to think that, you know, oh, like a bolt of lightning strikes them and they completely change their life forever. Um, for us, and it's I think it matches more reality, which is a progression. You know, yeah. I I just mean so, the moment you jotted it in Evernote or were like, oh, yeah. just the, oh. the the seedling. Yeah, so that was uh, May 15th, 2011. Yeah. Um, so I, again, you know, so I was doing uh, as a freelance developer i had to do a lot of uh, business development and i saw that i was actually really good at it but never any real hitting room sales work just my relationships and my reputation is what powered an amazing business and allowed me to build a really great team um, work with amazing clients but I saw that I was actually terrible at it, right? Meaning technically, I would meet someone for coffee and then two weeks later, forget who they were. Right, it's pretty um, common, yeah. And uh, then, or a client project would finish up and I would never engage with them again because I was so focused on whatever's next. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think that that ended up being a big guiding factor for me because that was i said like well this is something that could be solved with software mm -hmm. and so i wrote mm -hmm. the i wrote down the idea for a what i called a proactive crm um on may 15th uh, 2011 yeah and i want to follow some of these things you know when i was reading the intro and there's so much in that intro you know there's <laughs> you know the idea phase 
you know, when you wrote it down, there's a hiring phase with the 52 employees. There's a revenue phase with the millions in revenue. There's the, the raising money phase, which is the 12 million in venture backing. And then the, the customers phase. So I want to kind of follow each of those in like a timeline or evolution so I don't get confused. Um, so the idea portion, take me through the evolution. What did you envision when you first started and compared to, obviously, it's probably a lot different than it is is now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think there's still elements, the, the core, the, I'd say the soul of the idea is yeah. still there, yeah. right? Like what and did you want it, to do when you first started building it? Yeah, I mean, so it is a proactive CRM. And the actual product was completely different than, uh, than what is today. Right. It was something that would monitor your inbox. Mm -hmm. And whenever it would detect a new relationship, it would email you and say, hey, who is this person? It would ask you three questions. You would just simply reply to that email yeah. with answers to those three questions. Mm -hmm. And then we would do some magic on the back end and then upload that into our database, yeah. which was cool and ideas. Like it was cool the first few times, and then all of a sudden you realize, like, oh my god, it's actually sending me like, like dozens of emails <laughs> a day, and if I have to respond to every single one, oh, this is terrible. Um, and so that failed. Um, but we kind of go through that. We started at least kicking off conversations and starting off a lot of really great. Uh, we started off. We started start having really great conversations and really start engaging with the right people. And that ended up kind of guiding and forming the product to what it is today. Yeah. And I could see that because what was the pain points you were having with other CRMs where I could see, okay, you just reply and it's entered in as opposed to going in and trying to enter in a bunch of stuff, right? So what was the pain points you were experiencing with other things that made you obviously create this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the core problem that we saw was that CRMs nowadays, e you know, even, you know, I, I hate to say most other ones besides Contactually, make you do work. Right, right. Right. You know, a, 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 a sales force is there as a database to show you what happened in the past. Yeah. And in order to fill that out, you have to keep putting information right, in. Right, right. It doesn't tell you what you should be doing in order to really move the ball forward. Right. And so that was our idea is how can we build something that really pushes the ball forward for people? Yeah. And so we said, well, instead of making you spend all day entering in data, well, all the information is in there. It's in our email. It's in your calendar. It's in your social media accounts. It's in your Excel spreadsheet. Right. Let's go out and get that. Right. And then we said, well, instead of making you go and enter, like go and like figure out who you need to talk to and pull reports and set reminders, well, you probably know how often you want to stay in touch with people. So why don't we just go ahead and, you know, and start suggesting people that you should talk to. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of like, again, we started thinking kind of that. It's like an intuitive, aspect. intuitive way of who should we be keeping in touch with or contacting? Exactly. And then like through the customer development that I was mentioning earlier, well, you know, one of our, one of the, um, one of the customer calls that we had said, Hey, well, I, uh, you know, you're just kind of like reminding me to follow up with like all of these people, but really like I have buckets of people that I like to follow up mm. with, right? And I like to think about my relationships as being in different kids. And they said, oh, that's a good idea. Like let's, let's, let's think about like putting into people into buckets. And that's now a, a core part of our system, right? right. Um, and I think that's a good, that's a good anecdote that shows like that yeah. good customer development yeah. can help you not necessarily – completely change your idea, but really make it much, much better. Yeah. So, Svi, that's a great, what's another example of a customer that helped kind of shape things or gave you an idea or even made you kill a feature or something that you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that probably like another really, really good one um, is honestly relate to buckets is we someone suggested like hey um you're making me put all these contacts in a bucket it's actually really boring wouldn't it be funny if you made a game out of this ha 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 right mm. and thanksgiving weekend 2011 you know i hacked together this little arcade game 
um, we call the bucket game. And that's now a big central part of our product because we allow you now to bucket thousands of your contacts by playing this little stupid arcade game. Mm. Um, and again, ch completely changed how people thought about our product too. Again, all from just like a little note that like we just happen to be alert enough to pick up on. Yeah, I love that. So after the the first version, e you know, e emails you three questions, you email back. What was the next major version that that you came out with? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously that you know you can imagine you know both you know through you know through data analysis and then through customer feedback you know that product was that feature was very quickly soon chopped. Right, right. Um, we came up with the idea for buckets. That was really important. Mm -hmm. um, we initially kind of thought that, all right, well, contactually should look just at your email. We call ourselves an email CRM. Mm -hmm. And people said, hey, well, my contacts aren't just in my email. They're also in this Excel spreadsheet over here. Mm. Um, they're also in my social media accounts. Yeah. And so we had to think very clearly about, well, now we need to connect to all these other sources. Mm. And once you connect all these other sources, um, you need to be able to handle like dirty data, deduping, merging, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So do you have to create API? What do you do? Uh, it was a lot of really hard work. You know, we had to create integrations with all these different partners. Yeah. Um, help users pull the data in and then once we had the data well we had to build some really um some really hardcore algorithms on the back end yeah. that could identify all right well jeremy weiss over here is probably the same as jeremy weiss over there yeah. so let's give you the user the option of merging these two and once you merge them well how do we combine them so. yeah how do you decide which integrate because it's obviously a lot of very time intensive energy intensive how do you decide which integrations to actually do and not do uh customer development yeah yeah like cu customer development is really what uh, still what guides us today yeah. so we really understand like what our customers need where our customers are looking for and uh that ends up kind of being a big uh, big kind of like the wind behind but wind behind our sales yeah. so Svi, so what excites you about the product right now the results is driving for people yeah give it give a few examples or give one example Oh yeah, I mean we know that it's it's a very common thing, you know, for example, for a real estate agent, right, to come on board our system and within the first week mm. we've gotten them a new contract, right, which is another 5000 bucks in their pocket. Right. Right. It's huge. That yeah. that happens all the time. Um or we say like or we hear people saying, "Yeah, honestly, like this uh this has changed my business. You know, I made mm. an extra million dollars this year um, by using Contactually, yeah. right? Um, and that really helps. And so there's all so there's the the wealth side of it. Yeah. But then there's also I think the the health side of it. You know, people say like I feel good using Contactually. I feel my database is clean. I, I understand who my relationships are. So I think there's the there's that kind of like integral act of bringing order to chaos that really helps people. And so yeah. for me, like, listen, I'm a developer. I'm a geek. I love cool product. I love seeing what's coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly to myself, I'm now much more motivated by the impact it's making on our customers. Yeah. Well, so you break that down for a second, the million dollar one. So someone says, I just made a million dollars because of your software. What did they do? How did they use it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the core of Contactually is about helping you stay engaged with the relationships that are going to make you successful. Right. Right. Um, and so the challenge is just like I said, you know, I may, you know, I would meet someone for coffee and two weeks later forget who, who they were. Right. Well, what if that person, you know, if I'd stayed in touch with them just, you know, another six months or so, what if that person would have walked up and said, Hey, I have a, um, a client project that's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Right. Oh, well that's, another hundred thousand dollars that can actually actually made me because I followed those suggestions. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. And so there is this whole, you know, there is this almost the serendipitous feature um, where can actually surfacing these relationships that mm -hmm. again, we're not, we're not plucking things out of thin air, right? We're showing you your own information, right? But by pulling that up, we can simply say, mm -hmm. Hey, here's someone that you should, here's someone that you should talk to. Yeah. And they're like, Oh wow. I, totally forgot about that person. right right yeah so what about the future 
I want to I want to go next on the hiring, but I have to hear anything you can share about the future right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are going to be a multi-billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. That's what we believe. I, I, I avoid all the unicorn talk and nonsense nowadays. We're not raising capital like that right now. Um, we truly believe we're onto something huge. Mm-hmm. And so there are a number of things that we're working on to kind of build that up. I mean, one of the bigger things I can share you, which is yeah. obvious, um, is um, better engagement engagement with people in the office or when they're away from their computers. Mm -hmm. Uh, So our mobile applications have been probably one of our bigger failings on the products. Um, We just haven't really invested much resources in them. And so now we're changing that around and we're actually dumping tons of resources into having really, really strong mobile applications. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those examples. Um, You know, we we're starting to see that more and more teams and actually larger enterprises are coming on to Contactually. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to understand, well, what are your needs and how can we serve what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful too. Yeah. So Svi, that takes me to the hiring timeline. I was reading your post also on inside contactually the failed experiment and so talk about that for a second um what what is the failed experiment for people who don't know oh uh so our our um so obviously i mean one of the things that we care about is company culture yeah right and especially as a company grows from being you know three or four people that yeah obviously you know every single thing everyone's doing to be yeah. 10 people that have a pretty good idea to 30 to 40 you know naturally people stop knowing what everyone else is doing yeah um and the the sc- that's not such a big deal the scarier thing is what happens when marketing doesn't know what sales is doing right right or engineering has no idea what customer success is doing then you start to kind of you know, generate these huge refs or silos. Yeah. And so our thought that we tried to do of kind of breaking down these silos was instead of marketing sitting in one area of the office and yeah. engineering sitting in another, um, everyone would sit together and they'd be all jumbled and mixed up. Yeah. And maybe even we'd like which ask every once in a while just to keep things fresh. Um, it was a failure. Yeah. It was, it was really confusing. It was noisy. People like, would feel isolated from the rest of their teams. Um, and we said, all right, let's just kind of like, let's just kind of like call this a failure and like, you know, let's find other ways for com- for right. teams to interact. Right, right. So it wasn't a complete failure. I mean, you, re- <coughs> you, you created the open space, right? And you just kind of restructured it, right? Yeah, we still have an open office. So yeah. like, you know, our engineering team can still kind of like, they're still around and they're still kind of like, you know, they're not necessarily closed off from everyone else. Yeah. Our, you know, our sales team sits next to a lot of our customer success people. Our marketing team sits near sales. Um, so people know each other and can talk to each other about what's going on. Yeah. Um, but the whole idea of like intermingling each team, that didn't necessarily work so well. Yeah, yeah. Because I was having this exact conversation with the founder at Thanksgiving. And so I forwarded him your post because he's – it wasn't just silos for them, but they felt like – people are on different floors they almost mentally felt like they were above yep the other team members or whatever so they're doing the exact same thing kind of just making an open floor plan so i sent him your post so he doesn't try to intermingle those <laughs> team members <laughs> like you did so yeah i think there are other hacks that a growing team can do to be able to kind of you know further break down silos but um mixing desks no no. Yeah. So we'll start with the hiring. So obviously you've had a lot of big milestones. You've gone went from two to to over fifty two. So what was the continuum there? So how'd you meet your co founder? Um so I have two co founders actually. Yeah. And I met both of them through the local startup community again. Okay. So I, I'm very involved in fostering a really solid community here in Washington D C and and both of them there you know, kind of through my prominence just kind of like met me and just started casually chatting. So Jeff, um, you know, Jeff, who's our CTO, he was just moving here from um, from New York and was starting to look for a job. And I said, oh, well, 
I'm actually like, you know, my, my firm, you know, we're a software development shop. We're actually looking for people. So why don't you come work for me? Yeah. Tony um, had um, was at Microsoft and then was at a small investment. He has a decorated bank. past, like MIT, Microsoft. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so he was starting to say, I'm thinking about like joining a startup. And I said, oh, well, you know, you know let's just keep in touch. And I yeah. shared, shared wise work on Contactually. And yeah. so Jeff and I were at the, same, at the time, like starting to work on the prototype. Tony joined on as just kind of like just helping a little bit out with customer development. Yeah. And uh, then we kind of just like the again, you know, there was no like kind of lightning moment. where like, oh, my God, all of a sudden we're a company. <laughs> it just really kind of like we started working together and working yeah. together a little bit more. And Jeff and I were still working on stuff on the side and Tony's full time job. And then, you know, we I happened to be out in California showed one of the partners at 500 startups um a my you know the prototype and then they're like oh well this is really cool like why don't you give us like why don't we give you funding why don't you focus on it and we're like ah maybe not maybe not um and then you know a couple days later we're like all right let's do that um and then that ended up being kind of the point where we said oh well now can actually should really be a company and we incorporated and the rest is history so what was your idea going into 500 startups and showing them did you want an investment or were you just trying to get feedback? I was trying to get feedback. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just like, I believe in, you know, and one of the, I would say one of the bigger myths um, in, in startup land is yeah. that you have to keep your idea to yourself because people would steal it. Right, right. No one cares about your idea. Right. You know, the only thing that matters is execution. Right. Um, and so I, I, basically did the opposite. I showed everyone my idea. I showed everyone what I was working on. Right. And so I wanted feedback from everyone. So I was out there just to kind of get feedback. And uh, it just happened to be there like, oh, this is actually really good. Why don't you take this a little bit more seriously? Yeah. So that investment kind of make it, did it make it real to you guys? And that's why you incorporated it? Or what was the reason you kind of seemed to kind of go around that idea? Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, there was a bit of Yeah, there. absolutely. No, that um, that's a that's a that's a really great question. Um, my so you mentioned like Structo, which is a previous little application I built. Yeah. Um, that failed because I didn't have focus, and so I saw that that was uh, actually a really important thing that I needed. And so when Contaxi came about, again, I was falling to that same trap where I was starting to think about oh i can do this on the side and we can work on these other things too and i realized that, like that wasn't going to work and so yeah. then around the same time you know the offer of funding which would be a forcing function to really say oh, oh well be you have to you know you have to get rid of all of their clients you have to focus on this full time yeah. your other co-founders have to focus on this full time that was really important for me so so to me the investment was more of a vehicle that would force me to really say, yeah. okay, this is it. I'm yeah. all in on Contactually. Yeah. It's a big decision because you had a lot of other stuff probably going on at the time. Oh, terrifying, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what was the next major milestone to be with hiring? So it's three of you now. Yeah, the next major milestone was, um, I think, just in terms of, so we raised uh, our first round of funding, which is around $500,000. Yeah. Um, so that was a big milestone for us. Um, and I think then after that, like one of the things, one of the more interesting changes um, was our first employee. Yeah. Um, you know, all of a sudden, oh, well, it's not the three of us and, you know, maybe a bunch of interns here and there. It's like, oh, well, now there's actually someone who like, whose livelihood is dependent on us. Right. And that was like very weird, right? Because you no, know, we could have stayed as the three co-founders forever and like yeah. still taking it seriously. And all of a sudden I said like, oh, well, now my job isn't just doing work. My job is now making sure other people can do work. And so that's honestly now, you know, nearly 100 percent of my job is, you know, helping other people do the work here. Right. So what did you hire for with that first employee? Uh, software developer. Software developer. You're like, we need more software developers. So when yeah. did, when was your next hire that wasn't a software developer? Uh, we hired our first marketing person about uh, four months later. Yeah. And how do you know that was the time to hire the marketing person? Um, I think we look at our, so I, what, and this is still our kind of our attitude when hiring nowadays. 
Um, when hiring, we kind of look at our strengths and our weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing we could tell is, well, we're now we're very strong at software development. Myself and my co-founder Jeff, sure. we're software developers. We hired a third software developer. We're great. Um, we weren't very good at marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you know, Tony was kind of Tony, my my business co-founder, was starting to kind of figure it out, but still, marketing wasn't really his strong suite. Okay, well, let's hire someone who who can complement our weaknesses. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so that's still been kind of our attitude nowadays. Um, so it was really new that it was time. Like, all right, well, let's get the product on the market. We don't have the strengths right now internally. Let's go find someone to do that. Mm-hmm. So you have some operations, you have some software developments, and you have marketing. What was the next uh, hires that you made? Uh, the next hires, um, so we started hiring for salespeople, actually. Mm-hmm. That was actually really interesting. Um, yeah. You know, when all of a sudden, like, I was doing a lot of sales calls, my co-founder was doing a lot of sales calls, um, and we said, well, hey, we have all these people. Let's actually start trying to sell to them. And uh, so those first salespeople, that was a really exciting and big change, um, especially a software developer, right? You know, I think you know, previously, I think there's this like, um, there's this like um, negative view of salespeople, at least like, you know, it has, it's definitely changed over the past few years, yeah. but at least four, four years ago or so, like, you know, oh, salespeople, like, you know, you don't necessarily want to have them. We hired her for salespeople and it was actually one of the more eye-opening experiences of my life. Why? You know, understanding, understanding like how the understanding sales as an art, as an analytical science, um, understanding how you motivate salespeople, understanding what a sales script is. Um, we kind of went in almost, you know, almost purposely as like, we, we hired like very entrepreneurial people who were like, figure it out. Just, we'll help you just like go and figure out this whole sales thing. Um, and at the same time we learned too, you know, so we know about how to structure sales compensation plan yeah. we know about how to properly motivate a sales team we know how important good data in your crm is um so that's been really helpful did that approach work hiring really entrepreneurial salespeople? absolutely i think yeah. even nowadays we still want we still make sure that we hire people with that startup fire and startup passion so how do you um, yeah i was gonna yeah, say how do you train them you know obviously if you have like this head salesperson that's training wise or did you just hire the most talented people possible and you're like, they'll train us. Um, no, we started, we, we definitely believed in hiring very junior people mm. um, who had at least shown that entrepreneurial knack. Mm-hmm. So for example, our first sales rep, um, he had sold like, he had sold classified ads at his college newspaper. Okay. Right. And we're like, well, that's, that's a lot more sales experience that we have than we have, right? And he didn't come in with any preconceived notion saying, oh, I know how to sell. Right. But he at least like had some idea of like how to at least get started. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, we just kind of like as we kept hiring more salespeople behind him, um, just kind of more relied on the group to train each other. Now, of course, now we have a dedicated inside sales manager who has like a formalized training program. We know their ramp period, et cetera. But I think... Especially, especially initially, I think I do believe it's very important to hire people who can just figure it out. Yeah. So, Svi, you know, obviously right now you have 52 employees and counting. When was the major, the most influx of employees at one time for you? Probably 2014. Yeah. Um, 2014, we went in with, you know, 12 or so and left with like 30 ish or so um that was that was definitely a very very big change um huge and and i saw that like and you know i and i i think one of the bigger learnings i've had to come up with is the skills that i needed to start the company are very different Mm. than the skills we needed to scale the company yeah and even at different stages you know i can almost look at like six month increments and see that i have a very different job than i did before yeah. Um, so now, you know, it used to be like I was just I was doing my own work, right? Heads down, cranking on it. Then I was like doing my own work and maybe managing one or two more people who were kind of doing the same thing as me. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm now I'm managing direct reports. Now I'm managing teams. And now I don't even manage teams anymore. I manage just senior executives yeah. who then are managing teams who are like who are then managing kind of like individual work. Right. And so that's been a very big change. And so. 
and coming up with systems and processes and learning what breaks as you go along. Um, that's been that's been real a really eye opening experience. Yeah. That's really important. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's really important to talk about what are some of those skills that you needed to scale. Um, you have to be amazing at hiring. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, once I kind of like switched off, almost I I had to make this conscious effort of switching off the part of me that does work myself. You know, I can still hack around a little bit at night. <laughs> but really, I almost have to like right. dele I have to delegate a hundred percent of things yeah. out to other people, and so I realized like, okay, the number one thing I can do to make this company different is to hire the right people. Yeah, and so in order to hire the right people, I have to work my ass off, right? You know, I have to work incredibly hard and pound the pavement and really make sure that we're hiring the absolute best people because when you don't hire the right people you pay for it dearly yeah yeah um so you've learned this and so that is very important for us so what has worked really well with hiring and what has not worked for people who are trying to master the skill of hiring um what has worked is having a very clear process and clear very clear hiring process mm -hmm. that's been very important um, especially nowadays um, having like really good criteria where at the end of the day you can basically like come up like tell people all right on a scale of one to five how do you rank this person yeah right period and no one can give like a middle of the road answer right you can't say oh well, i'll give them a, a three or something like that like no like you have to either like them or hate them right mm -hmm. um so you know, pushing people to do that and having consistent questions that you ask over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So having good framework and structures has been important. Um, what's been challenging, I think, is um, is always when you you can either be like it's very easy to weed someone out. Um, it's very easy, like you know, when when everyone walks out of an interview, going like. Oh my God! They're the absolute most amazing person. We have to hire them right away. Mm -hmm. the The real challenge lies in the middle. Like yeah. when you see like there's like a, a diamond in the rough type of person. Yeah, when they're or they're really good, they're really good solid people. But like someone says, ah, I still have some reservation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it used to be I'd be like, Oh no, nah, whatever. Like it's totally fine. Just yo, know, you're. It's just probably just you know the way what you had for lunch or something like that, right? Um, <laughs> right. But instead, it's you know you actually have to. What I've learned is you have to be very very in tune with that. You have to go, oh, this person had this one little reservation. Let's pluck on that. Yeah. And it turns out that reservation actually becomes like a turns out to be the big deal breaker for them, right? Mm. Or someone said like, hey, listen, you know, all of you are middle of the road, but he told me this one thing. That really set it like in my mind set him apart, and we're I'm very close to pick up on that. So that's been important for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. One of your blog posts, which is part of the solution, and your views changed a little bit. Seemed when you watched the the Facebook. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what changed for you when you saw that? Yeah. Absolutely. So you're talking about the unconscious bias training, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think nowadays. At as you know, let's you know, you know more liberal, younger you know younger professionals. Um, I I especially at least you know had the you know had the mindset of like oh well, I don't care about race. I'm I'm blind to you know I'm blind to you know I'm blind I'm blind to you know people's skin color, sexual orientation, things like that. So right. I'm not going to even think about it. It's not it's not a big deal for me. And what um in looking into kind of unconscious bias is actually like the understanding that like it or not, right, we unconsciously have biases that we're not aware of. Right. Um, and so it's very important to almost keep yourself in tune with and almost understand and accept that you're going to have biases. Right. And by understanding that, just like you know, I was talking about managing your own emotions, right. understanding that you are an imperfect human being, that allows you to then think much more critically about people. Yeah, yeah. I suggest people check out, not just contextually, but your website, Svee Band, because you have some really good blog posts that details out some of these thoughts. So I really encourage people to check that out also. And Svee, so on the revenue side of things, so the idea, evolution timeline, the hiring, 
Um, I love the skills that scale. I think that should be your next book, skills that scale. Um, and the, the revenue side of things. So yep. did you, when did you start charging? Uh, well, again, <laughs> there was, there was not one point where we start charging, right? You know, through customer development, even back in 2012, yeah. we still had a pricing page up. Okay. Right. Um, where we didn't, e we didn't even know how to process a credit card, but we put that in there so they could, um, we put that in there so they, we could at least learn what people would be willing to pay. Mm. Then we kind of started putting in a credit card form and didn't really expect people to do that. So yeah, of course, like I was the first customer, my mom's credit card was the <laughs> second customer, right? right. Um, yeah. And uh, then again, we so, slowly started like converting some of our, you know, free customers, you know, the previous beta trials over to being paid customers and but we still never really required it. You could still basically kind of like not pay for contaction and be fine. And then we kind of started like making it a little more formal. We added salespeople to start doing it. So we really kind of started 2014 with like just under a million in revenue. We tripled revenue over the course of 2014. 2015 uh -huh. has been a great year so far as well. Um, so that's kind of been really important for us. So what did you learn about the pricing from the beginning till now? Um, pricing is an art. Yeah. Um, yeah. People will pay, and I think this has been like one of the more. I, honestly, I actually learned this more um, when, like, when I was freelancing. Like, one of the actually key takeaways when I'm freelancing is mm -hmm. you don't charge how much it costs you to do the work. You charge how valuable it is for them. Yeah. Right. And so that's actually something that we took into contactually where, you know, and kind of a related uh, a related corollary is yeah. you chart you, you know, pricing also affects people's perception. And so we saw that as we increased our prices first at 10 bucks a month, then 15, then 20, then 30, then 40. And now we're $60 per seat per month. Yeah. People perceive the product very differently yeah. and hold us to much higher regard. Yeah. Which is actually really important, powerful for us, for, right. powerful for us, right? I mean, I think we have this attitude of like, oh, I pay seven bucks for Netflix, or I paid two dollars for this iPhone app the other day. Yeah. Um, no, if you really want a business tool that will generate you thousands yeah. and thousands of dollars in revenue, it's going to cost you sixty dollars a month, right. period. Yeah, and that's been really helpful. And, um, so we've constantly kind of increased our prices in order to provide better value to our users. Yeah. Um, and that's been important for us. Yeah. You can pour that money back into development, features, whatever else. Absolutely. I mean, when you create value of a million dollars or $5,000, what stops you at charging more than 60 some dollars? I think it was 67 or something dollars a month. I mean, there's a, listen, there's a fair amount of price. I mean, I'm sure I'm going to be a customer. So like, <laughs> don't, I'm not like encouraging you to raise the price, but I'm just curious why not $99, yeah. you know, or. I yeah. Know. I mean, I wouldn't rule that out. There's a fair amount of price elasticity, right? Yeah. I mean, I think you have to balance out with how many people you want to serve with how many, how big the market is, what the appetite is at various different price points. Um, and unfortunately there, you know, there's so many variables and you know, then the, there's also the emotional side of it yeah. that, you know, you won't know until you try changing your prices to say, Oh, well, 300 bucks a month. Right. Well, you know whether or not that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so also, can you talk a little bit about, you know, I know that you have on the, the homepage, people can try it for free, no credit card required. What's the thought process behind that? Yeah, absolutely. I know you've tested um, probably a million different things, so that's what I ask. Yeah. We have. Um, we only want you to become a customer if you're going to be serious about this. Mm -hmm. And so the 30-day trial period, it's not only just so for you, for you to kick the tires, but we only want you to start even thinking about being a customer once you've really kind of started digging into it. <clears throat> so, for example, what we actually used to do is we used to have a 30-day free trial, but we would collect your credit card right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we saw that a lot of people were putting in their credit card, forgetting about it. And then all of a sudden, two months would go by and go like, hey, what the heck? You've been mm. charging me for a service I haven't used for two months. I see. And we're like, oh, wow, this is actually a really big problem. Um, yeah. So we said, no, we only want to, you know, for example, our sales team will only engage with people when they're very serious about it. 
Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Because I know people are probably think, always thinking about pricing and is it free or do they have a credit card? Um, so in around eight minutes, I'm going to get through the timeline evolution of raising money, <laughs> customers, and mentors. Okay? So, okay. Rapid <laughs> fire. Let's do so it. So raising money. Talk about, because that's a full-time job in itself and it seems like you've done it really well. What's some of the the evolution timeline of you started with 500 startups and then where to go from there yeah absolutely we started 500 startups uh then we raised uh, around 500k from angel investors in 2012 mm -hmm. and then a million from seed vcs in 2013 um and then we raised uh from angel investors and a few seed vcs in 2014 mm -hmm. and uh that led us to our series a of 8 million wow. in uh 2015 congratulations so it's again it started off like you know, i remember like you know i still had i still remember you know with our current investors you know arguing with them and convincing them about investing ten thousand dollars right? <laughs> right and so when i saw the wire transfers come in for this latest i'm like remember when i was sweating you know about someone who didn't want to invest five thousand dollars in Kent actually yeah. um so yeah it has been evolution yeah so what's a big lesson from that you should impart on other founders with raising money um people want investors are investing in two things yeah they are investing in your ability to build a company and that the company is in a market that will be absolutely amazing Mm -hmm. um, so you have to have those two things. Um, I truly believe that it's, it's, it is one of those like art, not sciences thing. Um, I had to kind of almost decouple a lot of like the logic that, you know, logic that I thought went into fundraising yeah. and focus more, much more on like the narrative of where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. I should, think you should lead with the green shirt narrative for the future <laughs> fundraising. Um, no, but one of the people that introduced us is James Ledoux, I guess. I think he was an early... <laughs> Right, he was an early contributor, or what? and and he will tell you um, if you talk to him that he actually even initially said no, and only like three and only like three weeks later did he actually finally say yes. So what I convinced him. I still remember um, we uh, so um, Mark Suster, who's a, a very prominent uh, investor in, uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, he said that investors invest in lines, not dots. Um, and James looked at the one dot of when I pitched him yeah. and was like, oh, I don't really know. Contact doesn't seem, seem like much. But then I was able to show him the line, right? Mm. What happened over the months since I spoke to him said, oh, well, you guys really are doing something. So yes. whatever you I, say, as long as you like point up, it, it you probably get the. Yeah, I mean, and, and even nowadays, right? Investors don't necessarily care about what your revenue is now. Right. That's just a dot. Right, they right. want to know what it was and where it's going. Yeah, so. yeah. You have good book titles in you. It's like it's not the dot, but the line. So the you know I had a couple notes here. Um, some some really good advice that you've gotten from some of your mentors or investors. I have Christoph written down. I have Patrick written down. I have Aaron Battalion written down. Who would be you know what's some good advice uh, you've gotten from them? So the one I, the one I'd say closing piece of advice that I, I that I think is really important, which is honestly like the very first investor that we got on board um, who said yes to us, and he's still very involved in us. Yeah. Um, as he was kind of saying yes, yeah, again, it was never like a clear yes. You know, the only clear yes was when the check cleared. Um, <laughs> right. But the uh, but he actually sat me down and, you know, kind of told me the story about how um, uh, the allies in World War II the way that they would hunt a U-boat isn't necessarily going out, you know, searching for, like, looking for a U-boat in the water and then bombing it. They would rely on, you know, hundreds of different data points, right? right? You know, um, reports from fishermen, um, you know, flyovers, um, convoy sightings, things like that. And it'd be, you know, the, you know, so the U-boat hunters, right, would have to, you know, put together all these different pieces of data and, you know, like go you know, and you know validate some invalidate others and then figure out okay this is where we're going to go bomb yeah right and he kind of to he kind of told me that story and said honestly startups are the exact same way you as a ceo 
you will get an influx of so much information, right? Blog posts, data, investor pitches, emails, customer calls, right. um, your own head giving you different ideas. Your biggest challenge is pulling together all that information and then figuring out which way does your company go. Yeah. And that's been very important for mm. me. That, that allows you to like, you know, you know, obviously, you know, you know about like the whole idea about, you know, taking something with a grain of salt. Again, it's yeah. kind of the same thing, right? It's really treating data not as, oh, I'm just going to go act on this. But yeah. this is just another data point that then I can go and take and act on. Yeah, yeah. So the, the last timeline, which we're not going to get to because we have two minutes, but um, is the customer timeline. I'm really interested in, you know, the sales um, and getting you know, individual customers and then enterprise customers. But I want to just scratch that for a second and have you just talk about what you think people should know from your journey so far with Contactually. What would be the most important thing that we talk about uh, to close? The biggest thing that I think I've learned, which I think is applied to so many different things, is it doesn't matter how good of a job you do. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how well executed something is. What matters is, did you execute? And so that's something that I push my team on every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, a, a, a poor plan executed today is much better than a perfect plan to execute tomorrow. Yeah. And so I think the most important thing in our company has been to build and maintain momentum, not necessarily momentum of just revenue and growth and things like that, but mm -hmm. momentum of just people doing stuff yeah. in the office. And that's been very, very important, something that we've always, always pushed for. Yeah. So on that note, Svi, with the execution, what systems or structure do you think is really important that allows the team to actually better execute? Um, I think planning is very important. Um, so for example, what we do is we do like at the beginning of every month, mm -hmm. we actually shut down the company for half a day mm. and we do nothing but plan. We plan what everyone is going to be doing. Yeah. Right. And so that is a very, very critical moment because that makes sure that we, everyone goes in and knows exactly what they're going to be doing over the course of the month. Yeah. And so that's definitely very helpful. Yeah. Svi, any, any last words? Uh, I want people to go to contactually.com. What, uh, what's final words? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, you know, if I can be of any help to people, um, you can take a look at the writings I've put together at zviband.com. Yeah. And uh, you can also engage with me on Twitter, uh, yeah. at Skivas. Yeah, fantastic. Svi, I really appreciate your time and sharing your skills to scaling and much more. Everyone should check out contactually.com. Thanks so much, Svi. Thanks so much, Jeremy. A lot of fun. Bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.